everybody. Welcome to Online Church. I'm so glad that you joined us. Um, this morning, we have the pleasure of sharing with you a baptism that um, we got to do uh, a couple weeks back. Um, so let's watch that right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome here, whether you're here with us all around uh, at this rainy day at Nestle Bible Camp or if you're watching this uh, online at church. Um, I'm so excited to be here at Nest Lake, a place that means like a ton to me, and I'm sure I can speak for Janelle that it means a ton for her as well. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for this, so thank you for joining us. Um, for anybody who does not know who this is, this is Janelle Anderson. Um, currently she is uh, volunteering here uh, as spring crew and then summer team, and she is uh, part of Lighthouse. Um, and I think this is going to be your third summer at camp, yes, correct. <laughs> Um, so I think it's, yeah, just again, so cool that Janelle can get baptized here uh, at Nest Lake at a place that just has been a huge part for her, her faith and, and her growth in Jesus. Um, I don't want to share too much of your story, but I just want to share just a few words from a passage that I came across when thinking of what to say to you today. So Romans 6, uh, chapter, or chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, says this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So Janelle, it is so encouraging to see how God has been working in your life, especially in the last year, and I feel honored that you asked me to baptize you. I just hope that as you continue this day to walk uh, just in life and in faith that these verses can just go with you as a reminder of, of what you're doing here today and, um, yeah, the new life that you get to walk in because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Uh, I pray also that this can spur you on to keep Jesus as your focus as you navigate life and as you cabin leave here in the summer. Um, I'm sure you will need his peace because it will be stressful, I'm sure. Um, yeah, you've made such an exciting and an important uh, decision to step into these waters today, and uh, this is a decision that follows Jesus' example, um, and yeah, just declares that he is your only authority, and that you now obey him. I also would like to encourage you to keep leaning into the church, wherever, wherever you are, whether that's here in Prince George at Lighthouse, or Bible School, or really anywhere. Um, just continue to pursue community and fellowship. Um, <laughs> Be with other believers and use the unique gifts that God gave you to be a blessing to both the church and to the community around you. Um, so yeah, why don't you share your testimony now? Cool. Okay. Um, to start it off, the basic generic Christian testimony. Um, I wasn't born into a Christian home. We went to church on and off growing up, but nothing really stuck with me. I wasn't really interested in any of the Sunday school stuff. Fast forward to late 2017, I met Elliot. He introduced me to Lighthouse, and I started to gain interest in the idea of there being a God. A few months later, Elliot again introduced me to the idea of working at Nest Lake for the summer of 2018, and so I did. I learned lots, but soon after the camp high wore off, I was back to living the life very far from God. The summer of 2019 rolled around, and I was back at camp, and once again, the camp high wore off soon after. I fell back into my old ways, and then, whew, and then 2020 happened. I was more alone than ever, and I was struggling a lot with vaping. During the world's time, or during the world's time of confusion, confusion surrounding COVID, June 9th of 2020 was the day my faith transformed. It was the first time in my 18 years of life that I actually believed God was real, and I was truly transformed. Today, June 9th, 2021, mm -hmm. I am reading this to you. Um, this day marks one year of being free from vaping, and it also marks one year of me being a Christian. And I've been called to take this next step um, in my faith, and I'm so ready to see what God has in store next. Okay, sweet. Janelle, in obedience to Lord Jesus Christ, and from the basis of your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi guys, I'm just going to read us our call to worship for this morning. It comes from Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. 
I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Will you stand as we worship together?
Fort George. Uh, this is Dan. I'm good, glad to be with you today. And I'm dressed up in my painting clothes because that's what we're doing uh, here at the church in our sanctuary this week. Uh, we started already. We got the primer on and we're getting our first coat on today uh, or Saturday, I guess. Uh, but uh, we still need our second coat on. And so if you want to help out, please give the church a call. Uh, also, just a heads up, we still need to raise about $18,000 towards this project. And so I want to encourage you to give generously to that end. Uh, you can give online uh, via our website. Uh, just mark renovations in your uh, giving, uh, or you can come into the church and do that in person, credit card, uh, whatever, it's all good. So would you pray with me as we get started? Heavenly Father, thank you for your uh, sovereignty, your goodness to us, and we love you, and we come before you today hungry to hear from you from your word. And so uh, come, Lord Jesus, speak to us, move uh, in the different places that we find ourselves in today. In your name we pray. Amen. So have you got a favorite tradition? Uh, one of my favorites happens Sundays after church. Uh, we all go home as a family and uh, I get to cook lunch. Uh, it's always hash browns, eggs, and bacon. So every tradition, in my opinion, is better with bacon. But some traditions are a bit strange. So uh, baby de dedications in Karnataka, India are uh, one of these strange ones. Uh, it involves the kid uh, getting dropped from the top of a temple, uh, 30 to 50 feet often, and caught by the family in an outstretched bedsheet like a trampoline. Uh, and the practice is intended to bring good health and fortune to the kid, assuming they survive. Uh, that's the, the tradition. Of course, this got posted on uh, YouTube in 2009, and now it's illegal. That's kind of the way it goes. Anyway, uh, another one, uh, you know how traditions uh, at weddings are, and so often the bride and the groom will smear cake in each other's faces. Well, in Scotland, uh, the day before the wedding, the friends capture the bride and groom and throw food at them. Uh, rotten vegetables, uh, fish guts, sometimes honey. Uh, at the end, they're totally covered. It's absolutely nasty. And the best part about this tradition, there's no meaning to it at all. It's just for fun. Uh, you have to take the internet's word for it. It's tradition. And of course, traditions don't have to make sense, right? There, there doesn't have to be any truth behind them, but they often uh, become important parts of culture. If you've been with us over the last several weeks, you know that we are in a series looking at the historical Jesus that Mark preserves for us in his gospel. And Mark recorded this just 35 years or so after Jesus' resurrection, which means this is the rawest account of Jesus that exists. And uh, that also means that there's still piles of eyewitnesses around who actually walked and talked with Jesus and who could attest that Mark had it right. And so if you wanna know who Jesus was, then you need to start with Mark. Well, surprisingly, uh, this is a bit controversial today. Uh, there's all sorts of different claims being made about who Jesus was, and uh, people want to uncover the Jesus behind the traditions. And so uh, in March, the chosen, 
a TV series came out. It's all about Jesus and his disciples. Uh, History Channel has their own rendition, a, a docu-series that started in 2019 called Jesus, His Life, and it claims to be, quote, a comprehensive retelling of Jesus' story from a historically accurate as well as biblical perspective. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, If those are a little too educational for you, you can always go to Netflix. They've got a smattering of Jesus films as well. There's one, a series called The Messiah, as well as a movie called The First Temptation of Christ. Uh, Both come out within the last couple of years. The point is, culture is intrigued by Jesus. But The intrigue that culture has always revolves around some new information. And so there's some new historical insight or uh, a new interpretation of a biblical text based on some cultural perspective that hasn't been unpacked before. Whatever it is, the consistent theme is that people want to get away from the Bible as the source. Well, Uh, That might all sound very modern to you, but actually, this isn't anything new, not a a really new idea. And so 2,000 years ago, people were doing the exact same thing. Uh, They preferred their own tradition as the lens through which to view God. And Jesus actually challenges this view, this uh, normative view of his day, and it's a normative view of our day. Jesus challenges it in a way that was incredibly controversial back then and is just as controversial today. So you got a Bible, Uh, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 1 today. And as you find that, would you stand up with me in hunger and anticipation of the God of the universe speaking into our lives. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands which were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to let, you've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother should be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares uh, that uh, that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and you do many other things like that. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and sit down. So strange text, right? A ritual washing, dedicating things to God. What does this have to do with us? Well, lots, actually, but the main issue here is actually encased in this cultural context that we need to get our heads around first. So the Pharisees uh, cared about religious purity, and they looked out at Jesus' disciples uh, who are eating with defiled hands, and they can't believe it, right? Like, how could Jesus surround himself with people who weren't concerned with trying to honor God? Of course, this isn't a germ thing. Uh, They don't know about germs back then. What they thought is that when you would go into the marketplace, you'd bump into a bunch of sinners there, and and their sin would get onto their vegetables, and it would infect you with impurity. And and if you're going to be holy uh, in order to come before a holy God, then you needed to make sure that you washed yourself when you got home. And they did this because God told them that his people needed to set themselves apart. So, for example, in Leviticus, we read, set yourselves apart to be holy, for I am the Lord your God. There's all sorts of other commands, actually, throughout the Old Testament, like honor the Sabbath and don't eat unclean food and don't touch dead things and honor your father and mother. And and these things set Israel apart. But if you're like a type A person, 
you might want a bit more structure than that. Like, what does it actually look like to honor the Sabbath? Well, the Pharisees were type A to the core, so they fleshed these rules out to make it easy to practice them. So for them, just for example, honoring the Sabbath meant you didn't extinguish a fire or start one on the Sabbath. You didn't put new laces in your shoes on the Sabbath. You don't boil water. In fact, they came up with 39 different categories of work that couldn't be done on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees actually did this with all the laws in the Old Testament. So they put contemporary examples uh, on these laws and surrounding these laws so that people could easily tell when they were keeping them and when they were breaking them. Brilliant, right? Like, wouldn't you like to know exactly what actions tick God off so you could avoid those and, and something simple you could add to your day so that you could get into his good books? Just do a little thing and God's gonna smile on you? Well, here's the problem. God didn't give us a list of stuff to do like that. Somebody else made these lists up, the Pharisees. And and Jesus has a problem with that. Now, he's not down on tradition. He just says, if you want to honor God, you should probably listen to God instead of some people. That means God's word. And this is actually what sits at the center of this text. So cultural context around washing and purity, but at the very center of this passage, it's about how you approach God's word. And Jesus says we need to, three things, we need to adjust ourselves to the authority of God's word, put ourselves in the right spot before the authority of God's word, we need to grasp its purpose, and we need to embrace Jesus' interpretation of God's word. So first we have to adjust ourselves to the Bible's authority and away from human authority. In verse 6, Jesus quotes scripture saying this, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. And then Jesus gives us a couple examples of this. So first one is washing, right? So there's this interesting thing. In the Old Testament, There are washing laws, but they only apply to the priests, not everybody else. But by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, everybody's got to practice these ritual purification rules. And and this means washing their clothes and their furniture and their hands in this obsessive way that actually goes against the heart of the Bible. So God's heart was that Israel would be a light to the Gentiles. Right back at the very beginning when God is calling uh, Abraham to himself, this is the start of the people of God, God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation, I'm going to bless you and make you famous, and you'll be a blessing to others, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. That's right at the beginning, this is what the people of God are going to be about, you're going to be a light to the nations. But the Pharisees had built this tradition of ritual washing up that ended up ostracizing the outsider as a contaminant, right? Don't let the Gentiles make you unclean. Got to wash that dirty Gentile stuff off you. So instead of shining God's light to their neighbors, they were actually shunning them. Second example Jesus gives is the Corbin laws. And so a Corbin means dedicated to God, which of course is a beautiful thing. But the Pharisees had turned this into something abusive. So they'd actually encourage people to dedicate their property to God. Hey, dedicate your stuff to God, right? Great. Except then when somebody in these people's families would uh, run into financial trouble and need assistance, the Pharisee would say, well, hold on. You can't use that stuff to help your family members. You've dedicated that to God. Of course, this is the exact opposite of what the Bible taught. And so Jesus concludes, verse 13, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. Now, why does this bother Jesus so much? Well, the primary thing that bothers Jesus about this is that the Pharisees are actually leading people away from God and away from the authority of the Bible. and that's how they're leading them away from God. So they're, they've built up these traditions. The traditions are the authoritative thing, and the Bible is secondary. And so as they get people to focus on the traditions, this is how we honor God, they actually are leading people away from God by leading them away from the authority of the Bible. You see, as soon as you fail to honor the unique authority of the Bible, so if you've got some other traditions that you hold up as being just as important, 
You don't actually, you're not actually worshiping the God of the Bible. You created your own God. And so the Pharisees then have created this God who loves rules more than people. Of course, this isn't the God of the Bible at all. Our God is a people keeper, people keeper, not a rule keeper. Now, here's where this gets tricky. It's easy for us to see how the Pharisees uh, are kind of crazy with all their rules because their rules aren't at all attached to our tradition. But we do have our own traditions. And so people my age and a bit older will remember the world of uh, don't uh, drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. Uh, Younger people are like, what kind of crazy song is that? But anyway, this was a real thing. And, And remember how people thought that these things were the things that God wanted. Do these actions so that you can please God. Don't do them, you're not pleasing God. That was yesterday's traditions. Well, where it gets really tricky is when it comes to today's traditions. And that's because uh, there's lots of these things, and they revolve around all the different things that we do in life. What makes somebody a good person? How do you be good today? How do you be moral today? So just think uh, social justice, sexuality, uh, interracial relations. And because these are today's traditions... It's hard for us to even know what they are. I mean, they just seem like the right things to do. But Jesus says if we're going to worship God, the basis of our lives needs to be on the authority of Scripture, not our own traditions. So what kind of things motivate you and fire you up? Are they connected to what the Bible says, or do they come from another source? Well, everything Jesus did was directed by the Bible. And so uh, whenever he was questioned, uh, he constantly replied, it is written. We get that in this text when he quotes Isaiah. But this is exactly the same way he defeated Satan in the desert. So three times Satan tempts him. He says, it is written. It is written. It is written. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, not the smallest letter or least stroke of a pen is going to depart from the law until everything is accomplished. So everything Jesus did from the beginning right through to the cross is so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus lived his life in perfect respect of Scripture. Now why? Why was the Scripture so important to Jesus? It's because without an authoritative view of Scripture, you cannot know who God is. Without an authoritative view of Scripture, without seeing the Bible as the authority, you cannot know who God is. You see, when we're our own authority, we actually build God in our own image. He cares about our causes. He approves of our shortfallings. But really, when we do this, it's like worshiping an artificial intelligence, an AI. So, Uh, Amazon's Alexa, uh, Google Home, these are brilliant technologies. Uh, I've got them in my house. They're super useful for uh, all sorts of awesome things like controlling the heat and lights and, and all that kind of stuff. But the direction of the relationship that we have with an AI is one way, right? So they serve us. We don't serve them. And so uh, if you tell Alexa, I love you, she will respond, aw, thanks for saying that. (laughs) But Don't get confused. She doesn't love you back, right? And that's because she can't. Why not? Well, it's impossible to love without freedom and autonomy. It's impossible to love without freedom and autonomy. So uh, you can't have a love relationship with your slave, right? You can't have a love relationship with your robot. AI, of course, is both of these, and so it must do what it's programmed to do. It will tell you, I love you, if you make it, but that's not real love because it's not free uh, uh, and uh, it's not autonomous. So when we dictate what God is like, it's exactly the same thing. That God is not free and he's not autonomous. He's only an extension of our own minds. But the God of Scripture is different. Why? 
Well, the God of Scripture can challenge us. If you read Scripture, you find out what God says to you, it speaks into your life, and you measure your life by its standard instead of measuring God by your own standard. And so uh, He can call out the sin in our hearts because He's free and He's other. But He's only this if we accept what He says about Himself in Scripture without reservation. We've got to allow the authority of the Bible to speak into our lives. So what's your view of Scripture? Are there parts of it that you don't agree with? Do you think there's stuff in the Old Testament or in Paul that's out to lunch or crazy? Do you think Jesus is outdated with some of his ideas about the Bible? Or do you hold uh, the Bible as the authority in your life just like Jesus did? Friends, we need to adjust ourselves to the authority of God's Word. Second thing. To do this, to adjust ourselves to the authority of God's Word, we need to understand the purpose of the Bible. So Jesus' big complaint against the Pharisees is, verse 6, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, it's not about saying or doing the right things, it's about intention. And that's because God's a people keeper, not a rule keeper. And so what He wants from us is not primarily our obedience, He wants our love. He wants our hearts. And understanding this is incredibly important if you want to be a Jesus follower. So every other world religion says, do the things that God wants in order to get God's blessing. Follow His rules and your life's going to be good. And this is what the Pharisees had bought into. So they wanted God's blessing and acceptance. And so they made sure they were following all of His rules. And they really made sure of that carefully. But Jesus says, you know, that's not it. You guys are following all the rules of God, but that's not how the Bible works. That's not the purpose of the Bible, and that's not what God wants. You can't force God to bless you simply by doing some right stuff. If you could, then God would actually be your divine vending machine, right? So you put something in that He wants and out drops something that you want. But that's called manipulation. And and friends, God won't be controlled by you at least not the real God, the God of Scripture. But friends, the purpose of the Bible isn't control, not of God or of ourselves. The purpose of the Bible is love. God is interested in you. He wants your heart. He he doesn't want your compliance. He wants your love. And the clearest place to see this is actually the Ten Commandments. Is there any other section in the Bible that's more about the rules than the Ten Commandments? I don't think so. But way back in Exodus 20, where God gives the Ten Commandments, they come to Moses on stone tablets. These are these big rules that His people are supposed to live their lives by and follow. But there's a context for these rules. They don't just pop out of heaven all by themselves. And friends, if you miss this, you miss the Bible and you miss the heart of God. This is incredibly important. Exodus 20 gives us the rules. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't commit adultery. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Exodus 19 gives us the context for why. It tells us why. And and here's what God says before He gives out the rules. He says this, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to Myself. Now, if you'll obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. Do you see the progression here? So God acts first. It doesn't start with obedience. It starts with grace. You see what I did? I saved you. I carried you. I I bought you out of slavery. And I did that because I want you to be my special treasure. All of that comes first. And then the way for us to respond is by keeping God's covenant. So God doesn't say, obey me and I'll save you from Egypt. Follow my commands and I'll make you prosper. It doesn't say that. Israel didn't even have God's law when they were in Egypt. So they couldn't deserve anything that God, uh, any of God's mercy. God chose them and he made them into a people before they were anything at all, and He wants to do the same thing for us. Friends, this is the gospel right from the very beginning. The gospel is not a New Testament thing. It's a Bible thing. 
Salvation has always been about the undeserved grace of God being lavished on us. It's all free. So why obey then? Well, we obey because we want to be God's treasure. We want to be God's treasure. If you obey me, you will be my special treasure, God says, Exodus 19. And being someone's treasure is about falling in love. So back in the olden days, uh, I'm talking like 1999, uh, there was this young guy with a leather jacket and a 25-year-old Porsche, and he fell in love with this girl. And then there were googly eyes and mushy love notes written on little pieces of paper and individually folded inside Ferrero Rocher's. Uh, He'd show up at her window at 5 a.m. and whisper through the crack, I love you. It would make you barf, right? So have you ever fallen in love? If you have, then without knowing it, you did something strange. So you studied that person that you loved and you found out what made them tick and and you learned what they love and and what they hate, what bugs them. These are their personal rules. Everybody's a little bit different. And, And you obeyed these personal rules, but you did it without thought because you just wanted to please your beloved. You wanted to delight them. And guess what? This work wasn't obedience. It didn't feel like obedience to you at all. It felt like an adventure. And that's what God wants. Obedience in itself is empty, but love-fueled action is joy. And that's the purpose of the Bible. God doesn't want your obedience. He wants you to see how He's courted you so that you'll fall in love with Him. And when you love Him, then you're going to long to delight Him because He delights you. That's where obedience comes from. So Jesus affirmed the authority of Scripture. He clarified the purpose of Scripture. And finally, He wants to interpret it for you. He wants to interpret it for you. In fact, He demands to interpret it for you or else Scripture will crush you. Here's what I mean. Sometimes when I read the Bible, it doesn't feel like an adventure at all. It it feels like crushing pressure. Like, have you ever read uh, the Bible and just been so discouraged by it? Maybe you read the story of David and you thought, okay, well, the standard is simple, right? All you have to do is be brave enough to fight and kill giants. Wait a minute. (laughs) If that's the standard, then I'm out, right? Or or maybe you read Joseph and you thought, okay, all I got to do is forgive my brothers Uh, And then that's great. But, uh, oh wait, forgive them when they sell me into slavery and tell my parents I'm dead. You ever been hurt by a family member that bad? I I don't think I can forgive like that. How about Esther? (laughs) All you have to do is risk everything. Put everything on your life on the line for the lives of those around you. That's not easy. And the Bible's full of these impossible stories. So have you ever read these stories and thought, you know, I need somebody to save me from the Bible. If you have, then you're halfway there and you need Jesus to interpret the Bible for you. And this is what he wants to do. This is what he does. So after Jesus comes back from the dead, remember those two guys on the road to Emmaus? Uh, and we read this. Then Jesus took them through the writings from, um, of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, everything in the Bible actually points to Jesus. Jesus is the true Joseph who forgave his enemies while they were crucifying him. Jesus is the true Esther who risked his life. He laid it down for the lives of those around him. Jesus is the true David. He did battle with your giants on your behalf and he overcame. And he did this all before he ever asked you to obey one thing. With Jesus, it's always love before commandments 100% of the time. And friends, that's how we need to read the Bible. We need to interpret Scripture through Jesus. But it's Jesus' kind of love, not our kind of love. 
Don't read the Bible through your own kind of love. Love isn't the lens. Jesus is the lens. This is why we need the authority of the Bible. You see, it's only when we encounter the objective Jesus of Scripture that we can come to the holy God of the Bible. Uh, Only when Jesus takes our sin upon himself and clothes us in his righteousness can we ever bear the expectations of Scripture. But when we see this Jesus and allow him to speak into our lives, then we find that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. So only when we see Jesus can we enter a love relationship with God like we were created for. So friends, don't make up your own traditions about what God's like. What kind of ideas do you have about God, the things He loves and hates, what He's like, who He hangs out with? Get those things from the Bible. If we make them up, uh, we end up creating an artificial God that we can't actually have a relationship. He just exists in our own minds. And friends, you don't want a Google Home God. He's so safe, He never challenges you. You want one who can love you. Only Jesus can, friends. And and He went to infinite lengths to do this. Jesus gave up heaven, came down from heaven to find you in your brokenness, and He put on your shoes to understand you so that He could woo you to Himself. He loves you you. So embrace the scripture that he left behind to show himself to you. And soften your heart to him. Let yourself fall in love with Jesus. It's risky to fall in love, friends. Let yourself fall in love with Jesus. And the burden that he commands will be light and easy. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as people who long for love but we're scared of it in the, other, in, the, in the same sense. Love is scary because it has the opportunity to change us. And Jesus, certainly your love changes us. You never leave anyone the same that you love. So we open ourselves up to you now. Holy Spirit, come and move in us. Enable us to be loved by Jesus. Open our hearts to that. Soften our hearts. We want to meet you. I pray for this in your name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Hi, everybody. Welcome to church this Sunday. Um, as you can see, the renovations are coming along really well in the church. We're having a painting party today. Uh, so I'm just want to uh, bless you with this benediction for your week. Uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfected, be, co- be comforted, be of the same mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Salute one another with a holy kiss. Have a good week, everyone. Thanks. Why don't you guys just join us as we worship together for one more song?
my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am Goodness of God.